college, y'all doesn't go, GTA, y'all doesn't go, the slap leaders don't go, and the coaches don't go. This is a new rule. Yeah, because parents are upset. It's not. Go home. It's not. I told you that you cannot play up a year. Is that where is that rule? Somebody saw it. It's not any. The team down to us saying there is no written bylaw right now in the conference table, but we are asking you guys to not. We are asking, but there's no rule up here. But why do you? The same when you guys are arguing. You don't have a rule because if you don't have a rule, why do you argue to us? So that is you. Not one organization fell asleep with three organizations no. before the biz. All, you guys all, 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 under the gym, I, right? all, yeah. you guys all, 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 and what I'm saying is, he just said it himself. The other, uh, other OHA and the other centers sure. all had this information and passed it on to the members. Well, so your question talking, is, you go talking, back to the We're office. talking about our 30 mostly. Well, right? Who do you represent? Represent you get your 20 NIHL. And they get it from the GTA. Okay, so that's what we're saying. They did their diligence. Somebody pull it up on the internet or on your policy, your rules, and show that a kid cannot play up. Because the NOHL rule book says a player can come up, play up one year. I have it right here. Sorry. National rules and there's provincial rules. All I can tell you is what the what a national rule is. With something that's been strengthened or, or changed from this standpoint? Yeah, okay. I think there's some really good information here. And then let's talk let's open it up, right? Because I think what what the frustration that you see, um, it's not a one, it's not one around where people don't believe in. in I agree with you on that. Yeah. This is yeah. this has been one of the first rollout the programs we've seen, the communications, and what we're dealing with is a transition problem, right? Which was where we are today in the season for for a certain age group. Right? That's, that, that's all. That's, when you talk about all people here, that's all we're talking about. They believe in the stuff. We need resources and help to make it work, and we're committed to do that. Yep. House League for this year, and we're gonna do our best. To, all the clubs agree to do that, right? Mm -hmm. But for select, we've got we've got these teams formed, right? That have got unique criteria, over and above the stuff around, you know, the issue around, you know, the summer raise around, you know, the fire the fire retardant. We've got meetings that happened in the city of Toronto that said, you you can't have coaches go on the ice and, and install barriers. Right? Install and uninstall, right? It's a union job, right? There has to be a union guy going on the ice. So that's not something we control, right? So we, we can't say coaches go on and, and, and put boards, and temporary boards or not. So there's some real logistical operational issues from all the member clubs here that represent like 27,000 kids, right? Saying we got a real problem, right? And what we're looking for is help on the transition. And Phil and, and Don West and others, we're going to need to go through those so we can get an answer to these parents. Because, and we need your support, Corey, in terms of being able to do that. Because that's what they're looking for is an answer, right? How do they do this, right? Absolutely, and, and, I agree. And we need a transition time. You just can't say, there's been no education, no parent education, no communication, just do it. And we're going to have a train wreck for a season for six year olds. But that, that's one thing where I would, to say there's been no information is, isn't. That isn't so true. So we know about it. 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 Corey, I think you've got a ton of tools that can lead to problems and solutions of the challenges of the boards, dealing with the phone barriers, different concepts, how you look at that cross-ice, how you look at breaking up the ice. So why don't you continue on that direction, and then we'll go from there. Okay. So, Again, when you're looking for tools to talk to your parents about why cross ice or half ice is better, the stats, and we can give you loads of information where they actually put computer chips on young kids and track them, full ice versus cross ice. Every player gets to touch the puck two times more, six times the number of shots in a game, 2.7 times more shots on goal per minute. Pass receptions, five times greater. Pass attempts, two times greater. Body contact and puck battles, twice as much. The stats all go to show and educate why reducing the space 
<laughs> is a better thing for kids. And in Vancouver, they had the discussions. In Calgary, we've had the discussions. In Winnipeg, and for some of these places, it's been four or five years since we've been doing it. And the biggest thing is, once you get in front of the parents and you talk to them about, here's the benefit, here's why it's better, most of them start to agree. And even at Christmas time last year, after some places made it mandatory a year ahead of the rest of the country, people are coming back saying, you know what, you're right. It is a better game. Instead of my kid being on the ice once every third shift, maybe touching the puck, once every three or four shifts, all the elements and everything that the stats go to prove are there. Skating speed, Hockey Alberta commissioned to study. Your average player, acceleration speed is 10% faster in cross ice hockey compared to full ice hockey. Number one is because they actually believe they can get the puck. We've all seen the puck in, in six-year-old hockey, five and six, when someone misses it and it goes all the way down the ice, no one skates after it. They all know, hey, it's coming back here eventually. The acceleration in small area in cross ice or half ice is greater. Players get up to top speed in 65 feet. So when you have parents or coaches are telling you, my kids aren't gonna get, be good skaters because they can't get up to full speed, the data and the stats show that that's not the case. Your average rink is 85 feet wide. They're getting to top speed before that. When it comes to actually training and development, one of the problems we've had in Canada or North America in the past, power skating, traditional power skating, has all been designed around up and down the ice, north-south, north-south, north-south. The game is not north-south anymore, it's east-west. The kids who are the best on their edges, the kids who are the best going left, going right in a small area, are the ones who end up having the most success at every single level. It's all about small area. Flat out use of maximum speed in hockey simply doesn't happen very often. What does happen is you have to be adjusting, changing, going forward, back, and always lateral turning, moving towards the puck, and agility skating. Studies by experts and scientists in the, in the sports system look at it all the time. And again, to show you examples of the best players. Our studies have shown that, that top end skating speed doesn't it's the ability to change and change direction and accelerate that are more important. That when you look at, at, at games at higher levels, very, very often it's the players who, who have the ability in a small area to accelerate, to win that race to a puck that's 15 feet away, win the 50 50 battles because they can get there quicker. Those things are more important than just skating up and down the ice in a, in a straight line. And so again, when it comes to players that having success in the games, that acceleration and quickness are probably more, uh, more skating up. In studies from the 2015 World Junior Tournament that was here, 84% of the game happened blue line in or blue line in on your defensive zone or the, or the offensive zone. So when our coaches and people are looking at stats, they want the people who can play in a small area. And it's a benefit for kids at, a, at, at the young age. There are so few, to, few uh, opportunities and so little amount of time where the puck is actually between the blue lines in a game at all levels. Yet, full ice practices with six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds are designed around coaches running flow drills, flow drills, flow drills. Looks good for the parents, it's good up and down, but guess what? We have robots. The small area, everything that happens in a game, 85% of it. And when we talk stats, we're talking player by player. The amount of time that number 16 red spends blue line in in the offensive zone, the number of time that 16 red spends blue line in in the defensive zone. It is very, very detailed on the analytics and everything that goes with it. And it's all used for how our coaches have changed the way they practice. We spend so much time at the national team level on small area working on skill in a small area, because that's what the game is. That's what the game is developing. Here's a quote on Austin Matthews, again, from Mark Crawford, who coached him before he came in the NHL over in Europe. His short area game is an NHL level for sure. It's an elite level. I believe that's a lot of what the game is becoming, those little plays that make you better when you're getting checked. <coughs> Quotes from his dad and different people saying, when you're playing small ice, you're never without someone 20, 20 feet away from you. You're always under stress. You had to learn how to use your hands, how to think ahead, 
where the puck was going, who was coming, how to turn, how to get away from traffic, create space, all that stuff. Some people thought it was a joke. They said it was, how do you teach kids hockey without going the full length of the ice? Well, the game of hockey happens within a certain distance of the puck. And so it's adapting to what, what are they actually going to see at older levels. And we know we're not here about trying to create NHL players, but the fact of the matter is that we're using the term select, advanced, elite, six-year-olds. There's an element here that people believe these kids are better than others, and they probably are. So if we want to make, continue to make them better as seven-year-olds, as eight-year-olds, as nine-year-olds, everything that's happening at the NHL level now is creeping down. It's in Major Junior. It's in Tier 2. It's in Midget. It's in Bantam. It's the way it works. Whatever's going on at the highest levels of the sport, find their way down. And more and more coaches are doing everything in a small area. It's about developing the kids, more people being active, more puck touches, more shots on net. Learn how to stick cattle in a phone booth. All of a sudden, when they put it on a full sheet of ice, you got that much more time to read, react. We have numerous interviews from Crosby, from Shea Weber, talking about small area games, why they would. I spent a week with these guys in, in Colorado the year of the lockout. We never scrimmaged once in seven days. Everything was blue line in. They all know how to skate through their neutral zone in a straight line, making one or two passes. What they all need to get better at is in the corner, winning the race to the 10 foot puck. Not once, every single day, all they wanted to do was small area. Three on three, four on four, five on five, it was all about situational. And again, the, the resources and, and, and everything that you guys see here is available. It's been available for a long time. And again, if, it's, if it means we need to do a better job of pointing people in the direction of where to find the stuff, then that's a challenge for us at Hockey Canada that we have to make sure and we do. Because the information makes sense. I've, I've lived it in, in Calgary for eight or nine years, our five and six year olds, and we have we have a six-year-olds in Calgary that are just as good as they are in Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal or anywhere. And we're doing it. And we're seeing the results six, seven, eight years later of the number of kids that are still playing, the number of kids that are skilled, that have good hands, that can do that type of thing. And we had, you know, I'll be honest, we had naysayers too. We had people who thought, oh, that's not real hockey. Grandma and grandpa's coming to the rink and they want to see their name and their name get announced. But years later, you actually also have grandma and grandpa talking about, you know what, I actually get to see my grandson or granddaughter play every second shift, be more involved in the game, touch the puck more, and those types of things. So I understand change is, isn't always easy. Change isn't always going to be smooth. There's going to be a challenge. And again, from, from policies or rules or, or regulations, I can, I can give you the timelines from when things happened nationally. It happened in January 2017, nine months ago. March 27th was the date that it was decided to be rolled out nationally, sent to all the provincial organizations, to all the minor hockey associations. How it got passed to you guys or didn't get passed to you, I, I can't speak on that. It's, it's a shame if you guys didn't get the information because I believe that if you had everything that you needed back then, I believe you would have had time to, to talk about or maybe do some of the things that you wanted to get in, in place for. And, and again, I, 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 can, I sympathize. My number one goal is to make sure kids play hockey and that they're having fun. That we give coaches good resources so they can run good drills. So they have videos on how to teach C cuts and a video and an explanation on how to teach a C cut and varieties of stations and all those things. At the end of the day, I, like I said when we started, I'm not a policy maker, I'm not a decision maker. My job is to try and develop coaches and develop kids. Just like all of you are here, if you weren't interested in that, I don't believe you'd be here right now. So our, our, our goal is to make sure we put all this stuff in the hands of, of you guys. Like I said, you'll get everything, you got everyone talking about it. You asked about the videos, the network app. There's an entire 30 practice plans on half ice or small area practices. And that's been out for nine or ten years. 
Click on small area games. There's tons of small area games. Half ice hockey, three on three. How do you run things like that? I agree with you there. I commented on earlier. It used to be nice if that was refined a little bit because a lot of those small area games are for 14 and 15 year olds. It's when you're trying to develop a high program, it takes a lot of searching. But I would also say on here, I can't see it on this slide, but the initiation manual has 32 set practice plans, probably about 500 drills, cross ice, half ice, and the majority of those have a video that says if you're teaching a two foot stop, here's, here's how you do it. There's, you know, again, we, we have tutorials. If, if you want me to do a webinar for all your coaches and walk them through how to, how to find every little thing on the app and, and how to share the practice plan so every coach knows what they're doing, we're, we're willing to do that. Tons, tons of resources, you know, and then, and then the last, you know, I know the, the last couple things I wanted to show, there's, you know, we talked about adaptations in other sports. I don't know if any of you ever heard of futsal. It's the, the small sided game version of soccer that every single player in South America learns how to play soccer, playing futsal. Ronaldinho, Messi, every single one of the top soccer players learns by playing that. And it's not on a full soccer pitch with a full-size soccer ball. It's done in a small area. I, I'll show you a clip of that. And it, it's, all about, it's all about ball skills. It's all about ball skills with young kids, so when they get to the play on the full pitch, that's where the best, the best players are. Take the role out in Vancouver? Uh, honestly, they did it a year ago, and their AGM for, for their province is in May. So they, they put it in place in May and made it mandatory for the entire province. So they're, they're a year in. One of the things I told Phil is British Columbia Hockey, so BC Hockey, has a manual on how to implement cross ice and half ice. I'm going to give you one from Saskatchewan. What Saskatchewan has done, on, and everything from game schedules, sample tournament schedules, how do you train referees to referee half ice hockey? Imagine these young kids, they don't have to worry about offsides and icings now. It's about game management, managing the puck, managing those types of things. I'm going to show you the one from Hockey Manitoba on, on what they've done. There's just another from. Ronaldinho, when he, was, when he was young. We're really starting to see this in prominent athletes and other sports that are coming back when people are digging into how did they get good? What are they doing? It all goes back to playing versions of the game as a kid that they're now playing now professionally and making, and making a lot of money at. So, you know, again, we don't have to play all that. You'll get a chance to, to see it all, but... The Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan model. Well, these guys have done this ahead of time, so as a, as a group on, on, on Ontario. Understood. And I'm not trying to be facetious with the question, but it is, a, it is a question that has to be asked. Yeah. We're here to talk about Ontario and, and Toronto specifically, right? So, one of the things, and again, Corey, I want to thank you for a great presentation. I want to thank you for your presentation. And in fact, I want to thank uh, Tom earlier for talking about Cranville. He might actually visit one day. Uh, but, you know, the, the thing that we're really here for is January, March, September. What happened in between? Maybe this isn't the forum to talk about it, especially with all the other groups from off of Canada, but there is some pressure to have to be asked. And I think that's why you saw some bubble of motion. And I think that's why eventually, it's getting late, we gotta talk about what we're here to really talk about. Just exactly, the, you know, and, and I appreciate you guys yeah. being here. I appreciate- Otherwise, everyone's doing this. Yeah. Everyone's getting aboard, they got it, two hours, we're all aboard. At least most of us are. Yeah. Except and yeah. and I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the challenges and the passion that's here. I, I right. you guys, we, we could, I mean, you guys could stand here and yell at me all, no, no, all day no, long, no, and, no, no, and, at, no and at the end of the day, 
the only the only thing that I that I can say is, from a timeline standpoint, it was passed in January. As a country, they decided end of March was the time to put it out there and publicize it and get all the information and everything in place. And from there, every single province has a little bit of a different protocol on how they roll it out. And Saskatchewan did this, and we, we were asked to show resources. What have other places in the country done? Saskatoon, this is, this is what they've developed, and they said, this is how we're going to do it. This is what we're doing. So we're sharing the ideas. Ontario is, is a different animal because northern Ontario is no different than northern Saskatchewan. Southern Ontario is not that much different than Greater Vancouver, you know. But when you're looking, yeah, okay. But you have you have a Pacific Coast Hockey League who has 25 associations underneath it. The landscape is very similar. So how Ontario wants to do it, it's not for me to tell you. I think Ontario has to figure it out with the member partners, just like the other provinces had. We're here to share with you ideas on what other people have done. And I would say at the end of the day, well, take... We have, nets. We, we have the smaller nets. Yeah. We have the foam stuff. And I think that's why it's like, okay, this is great, this is awesome. This actually was really good. I mean, I'm glad I came and I watched all the presentations, right? Uh, I guess I'm just, now maybe I'm trying to go all over and just went through the effect of the chase and talk about what we're here to Which maybe you, you, you guys don't even have to be here. To uh, Can I ask one more question about the future? Yep. How are you going to roll this out to the minor novice and novice in the coming years? Can I just ask one question? I think it's a very important question. You said it's up to Ontario to roll it out, how they wanted to, to roll it out. Can I ask you how BC and all the other prairie provinces rolled it out? Um, were they told? Uh, five months in advance, and then it was rolled out, or did, were they given a time a time limit? See, we're, we're we're constrained by by a time here. That's all it is. Everybody in this room wants to implement the actions. Everybody. We just don't want to do it under this time limit that is being thrown down our throat. It, we've only basically been given a couple of, a month, month and a half, and we're being told about it. Okay. So so we we just second. We've done all of this work, and we've had all these kids pay. Pay money, and it all comes down to we have to give rather the, the, the parents, if they want their money back, we have to give it back to them. The associations have to do that. Now, why can't the OHF turn around and say, okay, well, we, we do want to implement it, but let's implement it next season. So we all have this timeline that we can get ready for it and do it. We don't have any problems with that. It's just that they're saying to us now, you do it now, and that's all there is to it. Or yeah, or else. else. Or else. Or else. That's or it. That, so I'm, I'm under the impression that that's not coming from Hockey Canada. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me answer this man's question first. Okay. Okay. As a... <laughs> hey. Fra Frank and I probably have had, what, about uh, three hours of conversation over the last two days, kind of working through some stuff, having lots of conversations, walking through what we're facing and what's in front of us. And, you know, Frank and I sat down for an hour, hour and a half this afternoon uh, at the arena in, uh, and walked through some of the challenges that are being faced that are there. Um, and I can tell you, you know, one of the questions that, you know, I asked Frank and we, we walked through was, you know, what are the challenges? And Frank actually asked me a really good question, which is, why such the heavy hand? Why, why such the heavy hand on this situation? And Frank wasn't sure what the question or answer was going to be that, but what was the, the answer to that was, we have a climate in Ontario where we see our collective selves as individuals. Individual organizations that compete against each other. Members that compete against members. You know, OMHA versus GTHL, Alliance versus uh, GTHL, NOHA versus GTHL. We have associations that compete against each other for players and recruitment of players and keeping players. The heavy hand is... If one organization, okay, goes hardcore and implements this, and another organization doesn't go hardcore and implement this, okay, now we're creating a, a bigger competition between our organizations. 
There's a, I, I have the list of all the communication that went out on this from the GTHL going through, starting back in March 27th and about 15 or 20 communications and meetings with associations and going through it. Then question Frank and I talked about was, you know what, something happened, there was a breakdown. And where that breakdown is, we can either point fingers or as a collective, stakeholders in the game, okay, not individual organizations, issues, individual organizations, we can look at our one customer. And, and it's scary, we only got one customer in the room tonight. Mr. Uh, Mr. Andy, Andrew up there. That's the one person that, without that person, none of us are sitting in this room. But you know what? We're all trying to look in a situation saying, they didn't do this, they didn't do that, they didn't do this. And what we've talked about with Mr. Uh, Carbone, with Mr. Frank, is that we want to sit down. We all collectively want to sit down and find solutions to this. We brought in Corey and, um, and Dr. Norris here to provide solutions, opportunities, information, where we can get further information. We have GTHL staff here tonight. We have OHF staff here tonight. We have OMHA staff here tonight. Our goal is to be resources for you in the implementation of Cross Ice. We want to work with your organizations and walking through that. And as Frank said earlier, we have, an, I think, an opportunity here that we've agreed to sit down with a small group of the uh, house leagues or the organizations that are, and, and try to find a solution here on the implementation and on walking through it on the challenges that exist. And, you know, utilizing some of the stuff that we found here tonight, you know, what is our goal in trying to keep kids into the game, going through the game, dealing with the logistics, you know, how are we using our resources, how are we using our ice, and what are our challenges going forward. So I understand that there's frustration, and somewhere in a chain, as associations, some people in this room, or someone outside of this room, okay, I didn't get information, or it didn't get passed down through the information, but there is a lot of information out there. Corey, as Corey said, for Corey's side, there's a ton of information out there on the Hockey Canada website. There's available information that's been passed down. There's information on the GTHL site. There's information on our site, okay? And that's there, okay? But the next steps are, how do we get to the next stage of implementing, okay, cross-ice hockey and the challenges that we face in front of us right now? Let me, let me just, yeah, so let me say a few words. Um, so, and, you know, as, as adults, right, uh, I want to point out, you know, little Andre, you know, Mr. Audrey's kid, right? Uh, um, because of this issue, because the adults, right, with all this confusion, right, we have a six-year-old boy that couldn't play today, along with 23 other kids. But I can tell you, right, this was the worst day I've had in minor hockey in 20 years because I had to see six-year-olds cry because of what's gone on today, right? And I'm saying this stuff, you know, you just can't be forced it down the throats. Like, this is not about, you know, blaming fingers or pointing fingers, right? However it's communicated, we're trying to do the best now. We need to do the best for these six-year-olds, right? So everyone in this room has agreed that we all support the model, right? We've all said that. Right? We don't fully understand all of it. This has been a fantastic presentation today to help us educate, and we need to do much more. So, so Corey, we're definitely going to utilize you and, 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 and others. Right? The, challenges that the, 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 the challenges that we have are real when it comes to select. So House League, everyone is going to get the cross-ace experience. The select level, we've got some unique challenges in terms of these teams were formed. Back, back in April, right? They've got ice, they've got uniforms, right? They were expecting to play today in terms of their first tournament, okay? And, and, and we need to fix those issues in terms of how do we move forward in terms of doing that. The select level of hockey, and Corey, I'm not sure how much exposure you've had to the select model in, in the Toronto area. It's, it's a wonderful model in terms of, you know, if you're around tomorrow, I'd like to invite you to our tournament. Come and watch our, our minor novice, our novice kids and see the skill level that all these clubs are, are producing. So to me, it's not the fact that the model is broken, right? It's how do we make it better? And that's really the message, right? Um, and from a parent perspective, we need to be very careful. And what we need our government bodies to understand is, if we screw this up, because parents don't understand it, or they don't see the value, right? We're gonna have a bunch of kids that are gonna leave all of our programs. 
We're going to have 20 of the 30 house leagues uh, that have been around for 50, 60 years that are going to basically close their doors, right? We're going to have private entities, right? They're going to say, come and play with us because we're not under Hockey Canada, right? You can play full ice. You can do whatever you want. No worry about certification or safety or anything else, right? We'll take your money, right? So if this model ends up three years from now, we lose, okay, our, our core in terms of, of type minor novice and novice, right? I'm not sure how that benefits anybody. So we need to work together. We need to figure out how do we ensure we keep these kids and these parents, right? Because to me, the fundamental, it's not convincing us, right, that says this is the best model. It's convincing the parents. Because if we don't do that, right, from a, from a value perspective, ultimately they're, they're the ones that, that make the decision. If they see value, they'll spend the money. If they don't see the value, they're going to go off and spend the money somewhere else, all right? So I know we've got a meeting with, with, with Don that we're trying to set up and, and, and fill for Monday or Tuesday, okay? We need urgently to get a decision back in terms of how we're going to operate this year because we got 600 tight kids, six-year-olds, that are waiting for us with a whole bunch of parents that are really, really upset. So that's, that's really what I want. I want to make sure. And again, there's everyone's commitment here. We're going to do this cross-ice. And the piece that I think everybody needs to understand is the kids that play select also have to play house leagues. That means that every kid will have the cross-ice experience this year. The fact that they're getting an additional competitive level at select for this year from a transition perspective, I think there's, there's no downside to that, right? It helps us to transition to the model and, and everyone's committed to it. So that's really what I wanted to say. So, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure if, I, if you want to be put on the spot, Mr. Andrew. And I mean, hey, you had a tough situation today with your son and walking through that. Uh, you and I had a long conversation last night. Um, it's not simple, you know, the situation your son's in. We all empathize with that situation. But uh, maybe if you want to make a few comments as a parent, a parent in the room that uh, faced a situation with us today. Sure, I'd love to. I mean, I, I think, you know, observing this, um, you know, it's not about is half ice right. I'm, I'm actually not going to argue the science. I, I think many of you are in agreement that half ice is the right development program for our kids. I think the big issue for me really is, um, you know, I think you mentioned change and, and we, have to, we have to adapt change. And every day, like I'm an executive in a large corporation and I manage change. And, you know, we manage, we implement products, we launch services. And my concern is, you know, from the parent view, that there's a season starting in a few weeks. And what's the quality of the program that we can implement in three weeks, you know, to, to get ready for the season? I have no confidence that, even if we all put our collective minds together, that we could actually do justice to this program. And, you know, my counsel would be that let's embrace it. In fact, you know, I'm very blessed to have an amazing coach in, 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 in Etobicoke. 
And his philosophy is actually half ice practices. So we do small area games. He's a big believer in half ice. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually, you know, as a parent, want us to embrace this and do this. Is just manage the change, do it properly, and, and help us develop great hockey players and, and ha let them have fun. I think the frustrating part for me is, you know, in April, we, my, my son who's been playing select for two years now, he's played over 100 select games, you know, or competitive games in spring hockey and, and select. Tried out for a team, you know, with his friends who he's been playing with for over a year, and now he doesn't have an opportunity to play with them. And, and for me, that's a big issue. That's the big issue of it. Like, for him, he's an innocent casualty of this lack of change management. And, you know, I, I think you're, I applaud you for making a commitment to move down this path. And I think it's really how do we effectively manage a change together as a, as, as a group. And, you know, um, I think the frustrating part for me to some degree is, you know, we talk about rules and rule books, but, you know, my son is playing on a minor novice team and he has, you know, we, we submitted our roster to Hockey Canada months ago. And Hockey Canada has approved him to play on a minor novice team. So all along, we're going through this journey, practicing with the team, investing dollars, renting ice. And my, my wife's a trainer on the team, and I'm involved in the team. And we're in this situation now where, you know, Hockey Canada should have been clear and said, you know what, you're not approved. You're 2011 on a 2010 roster, and we would have addressed this months ago. This issue would have surfaced many months ago. And, and now we're, you know, the day of a tournament or a few weeks away from a hockey rink. And, and frankly, I'm seeing through this presentation, I was, I was actually, you know, I was listening to Keith's presentation. I'm like, wow, man, that's amazing stuff. You know, I was listening to your presentation. I'm, I believe in everything you want to do. But, you know, this meeting should have happened like back in March or April with these clubs. There should have been an action plan with an implementation plan. And this, you know, then we could have been ready for September. So just frankly, from an outside observer who's not dealing with this every day, like, you know, I applaud the work that we're trying to do and the outcome we want to generate for our kids. But frankly, you know, let my poor son play hockey. Let him play with his friends that, you know, he, today his friends went on the ice and he was crying in the dressing room. His coach had to come off the ice and hug him. That's what I was dealing with today. As a father, I think I failed today because I saw my son hurt and crying and watching his, his friends play hockey. And all he wants to do is play hockey, the game he loves. And, you know, if the, if the eventuality is half ice, great, I support it. You've got my commitment, I'll volunteer, I'll help, I'll go to all the parent groups and I'll sell it. But man, like, let these poor kids play hockey. Like, he wants to play with his friends. And that's, that's all I'm saying. Like, let's, you know, if you're going to implement, don't give the kids a bad experience in September because we're rushing it, because we haven't trained our, our, our teams, we don't know where to get the manuals. Like, I'm listening to this and it sounds like a, a project that's doomed for failure. So let's just do it properly and... Give these kids a great experience and coach them properly. Like, is it going to really matter if we've been doing it for 30 years this way? Is really six more months or another year going to really matter, in my view? So anyway, that's just my view, sir, for taking so much time. But... Thank you, Mr. Andrew. I mean, it's that, that opinion is very important and it's something that we have to take into you know, account as we sit down with with these groups and going through it. Um, and I think the, the, the one other thing that I, I take from that and, you know, as you walk through the conversation, sit down is, you know, the, the NYHL, the GTHL, or the MHL, this organization doesn't sit in isolation. And everything that this group does impacts all the cities that surround this and work around this. And those conversations have to be part of that discussion. We can't look just at ourselves, we have to look at the collective body. We, collective we do, but we have to look at the, but that's the collective kids. That's not one kid. That's okay. At this age, 30,000 kids we have to look at. And I'm not, and I appreciate, you know, every kid has to be looked at, but all the kids have to be looked at too. Why 
question here and then a question there. So here's how it's immediately affecting us right now uh, with our select program. We are going to implement it with the house lead program. It's, I believe it to be kind of a step back because we have an initiation program for three and four year olds currently and then we tier our, our uh, players, uh, a white division, blue division, gold division, rep development. So I think we have a, a superior pro, um, a product coming out of, out of there on the ice. But what happens is a lot of our players get taken to AAA teams at, when they get to minor Adam. So we, we're currently icing three novice teams, uh, and we want to ice two minor novice teams in the select program. But on the second team, we have three six-year-olds. Without putting those six-year-olds on that team, we have to gas the team. And that's going to leave 13 other players not playing minor novice select hockey. And they're not going to get developed. So that, that is actually hurting our association. I think that we should keep it in the house league program and keep it out of the select program for this year at six-year-old level. I believe that would work better, and I think that everybody in the room would be able to work with that. And then we could implement it in the select program possibly next year. Okay, so, thank you. Um, Grant Warden, president of the Leaside Hockey Association. Um, we've heard about the emotional cost that canceling the program would result in this year. There's also a significant organizational and financial cost to the collective organizations in this room. Leaside Hockey Association, we're in a fortunate position. We've got 1,500 kids in our club. We've got a very large hockey school program that's been increasingly successful. We implemented the IP program a number of years ago been hugely successful. Um, the kids and the families love it. We've also got four Tyke Select teams. Today is September 15th. We don't know whether they're going to play this year or not. If the teams fold, we're fortunate enough to be in a position where we could absorb that cost. But make no mistake, we're a not-for-profit organization. The rest of the families in the association are going to absorb that cost, and that's not fair to them. Select kids that are on, sir, are we harming select kids that are on the ice for three, four, five hours a week, uh, three or four hours more than, say, the one hour a week house leaguers? Are we harming them if 80 to 90 percent of their activities are, um, are cross ice, are within the, 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 the development model um, by having them play a full ice game? Is there harm done? Is there research on that? I, I would, uh, so no harm, absolutely. The net gain, not very large, of course, because you're talking about what are they actually doing when they're on full ice. That's the only thing. Um, and the only other thing for me, as I've tried to explain to you, is, um, and we've heard about responsible parenting, is to ensure that your children are, are getting a wide exposure to many different activities at this age. That's, that's the only thing. So for me, it, that's not the issue. It's about trying to do the, the right thing. I mean, you know, I'm appalled to hear all the challenges on the communication side of it very clearly. And I'm sorry I, I laughed then, but, you know, I mean, clearly this has got to be resolved and very quickly. Um, but uh, no, you're, you're not doing any harm. You're just, uh, I just wanted to point out that the one thing that you can't buy, uh, you can't give your children, ultimately is time. It's the one thing that is the one resource that um, we can't buy and, and once it's gone, it's gone. And so, as I reminded you, six years of age, 365 days of the year, what are you gonna, how are you going to best give them a quality experience to advance and that's all. We're going to wrap up in 10 minutes here because uh, I know Steve and uh, Corey have to get to the airport to fly back out. I just had a question for both, both Steve and Corey. Is for, from all the, all the research that we saw, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, if, if doing this kind of stuff is important at 6, why are we stopping at 6? 
And is what plans are there? Like it seems, it seems that the research shows that what we're doing at six should be gone up until 11 or 12. And I see you smiling. And where's the trade-off there between skills and development and, and, and just having fun? Uh, the, the, the key thing is it's, it's not all or nothing, and it's not like at a certain age it finishes. It's just a gradual evolution. And okay, here's one, here's one thing I would say. Okay, I, I, th I think it's... It, well, first off, I don't, it's for me, it's not a question of there's a sort of guillotine that comes down and it's one or the other. I think the exposure gradually is it's a it's a continuum. So there gives opportunity to do um, the eventual senior game at any age. Certainly, there's opportunity for that. For me, for me, it's all about making sure that you understand what you should be doing with the precious amount of time you actually have with them at the rink. And understanding, ironically, if you shape their lives away from the rink, that's actually where the, it's like an iceberg, that's where the, the bulk of their actual development will occur. So you need to be providing an environment that on the ice you're doing the best possible thing you can do, you're encouraging them to do other activities that will support hockey or hockey supporting other activities, swimming, whatever it might be, and then that they are playing at home you know, the, the, all the traditional things you used to do. If there's a frozen pond, they get out on that. They play on their driveway, they do that. And unfortunately, in Calgary, we have bylaws now that stop kids from playing on the streets, and that's adults doing that. But I mean, those, those are often the times when they're actually consolidating their skills. They're making up their own games, they're having fun, and they bring that back to the rink that you as coaches and instructors and volunteers move along on the ice. So for me, it's it's not just simply about what you're doing as an ICE program, it's understanding the lives of these kids. And it's not simply a six, it's just that, you know, I wasn't given a lot of information. I knew there were some challenges um, coming in. I was just told to come and talk to you about this development and, and it was something to do with six-year-olds. But it's not simply six-year-olds, it's, it's the whole continuum, okay? And I just wanna reiterate, I don't wanna throw anybody under the bus, but at the end of the day, um, we had tryouts advertised tryouts and they well, those advertised tryouts were on the league website and uh, it's challenging that uh, they were on the site it's challenging that Frank faced what he did today where we had approved tournaments uh, for those tight age divisions as well and the minor novice uh, and they did get approved um, I also want to express maybe a bit of a displeasure on my part being a co-chair of a hockey committee with the GTHL and uh, our part as a committee and objectives are to grow this game and at no point in time, uh, being a co-convene or co-chair of this uh, committee was this ever on our agenda. And uh, so we dropped the ball somewhere along the line in, in implementing it and getting it out there. And, uh, and I think we need to rectify uh, the wrong, if you will. And uh, I'm hoping the substance that's in this room today can be brought into that meeting of five or six and you still feel uh, the importance of getting this passed. So given what we have seen here today and, and our young friend up here, um, there is currently a tournament going on. So will the 2011s be disqualified from that tournament for, for this weekend or will they be allowed to play? That's all. It's probably not the answer and I, I can't change the policy. And I know I'm working with uh, our organization and working with the member partners um, on this overall issue, but it's um, it's not something that I can change. I can't go back tonight and say this can happen. Uh, saying that, um, you know, I think we're committed to Monday, Tuesday. It's a difficulty in this weekend, um, uh, but I think part of that is, you know, we need to look at the long haul here for kids so that, you know, um, 
a young player like Mr. Andrew, you know, has an answer for what's coming forward for the next eight months. Um, as much as an answer for tomorrow be um, something that everyone would like, um, transition, I don't have that authority or that power. We got time for one last uh, comment and then uh, we'll close things up here, so. Yeah. Paul Mace from the North York Hockey League. <clears throat> it's interesting to me that uh, the main issue that we're trying to resolve tonight is with regard to select. And yet uh, there's been no communication whatsoever with the North York Hockey League as to well, how we will handle the uh, issue if we are forced to uh, go half ice. Whether or not economically it makes sense, whether or not we uh, you know, because we're in about 30 rinks across the city, whether we'd be able to even provide, uh, you know, the, the proper equipment uh, in the arenas, assuming that the city would allow us to do it. Last night, about nine o'clock, one of the supervisors from uh, <coughs> the management portion of uh, Parks and uh, <coughs> Forestry and uh, Recreation Department called me, and uh, they're very concerned with uh, the way that this is going and the fact that there has been so little information given to them and. Uh, certainly to us as well. Uh, they uh, have all kinds of issues with regards to uh, unions, uh, to uh, the necess necessity to add additional uh, you know, workers in the arenas in order to do this. Uh, there was a suggestion made, I think, uh, to uh, one of the tournaments uh, that uh, <clears throat> they could operate uh, with the bumpers and put uh, benches on the ice to, uh, you know, uh, to sit the players uh, on. And, uh, we we're categorically told that that will not happen, that the liability there is so severe that, uh, you know, it just wouldn't happen. And the other thing that they're concerned about is if we were to, uh, it w was ruled that it is our responsibility to put them out there, we would not be allowed to put uh, volunteers out there without proper, uh, you know, the proper equipment to do it. Uh, the other thing is that uh, all of the, uh, the permits and so on, <clears throat> you know, uh, have been, uh, issued, uh, you know, uh, for months now. And, uh, you know, the uh, opportunity to turn back ice is, uh, is long past us. And, uh, you know, the city is not in a position to turn around and tell us that, uh, you know, that uh, the ice that would be required for 600 uh, young tight players to be on the ice would, uh, would be refundable or cancelable or whatever, you know, however you want to look at it. That's just not going to happen. And, uh, and I understand the city's point of view on it. Uh, they uh, feel that at least a year to, uh, to work on this thing, to phase it in so that all parties, including the city, uh, would be included in the discussion so that any decisions that are made are certainly compatible with uh, all of the groups that are, uh, that are, uh, are there. Uh, you know, I listened to Steve and I was really impressed by his presentation, but one of the things he talked about was the tiering aspect. One of the great strengths of the North York Hockey League is tiering. And, you know, I'd like to know what it is about our tiering, which is a, a huge factor for us. What is, what's wrong with the way that we're tiering this select program? Pardon? No, no, I'm not finished. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, in fairness to Steve, I'm not sure um, he knows exactly what the structure of the North York Hockey League is as far as games practices. So, I mean, I'm not sure it's fair for Steve to try to answer that, but I mean. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Okay. 
Well, I, I, um, the point I want to make as well is that when, uh, when, Corey was, when Corey was talking, he was talking about the fact that you know, Vancouver and Calgary and Saskatoon and all those places have embraced this program and so on. Their programs are very different from ours. And you know, I'd ask you, Corey, are there any programs out there that, that replicate the select program that's run in the city of Toronto? I mean, we've got 450 teams and 7,000 players that are playing select here. Is there any program in any of those western uh, areas that, uh, that replicates what we're doing here? Yeah, they play house league as well. Yeah, so that's what Paul said. There are pockets, but for the most part, nowhere in Canada is there select, select six-year-olds like you guys have in Toronto. There are... Sorry? It makes sense for uh, you know, Hockey Canada before they, they make a, a blanket ruling that involves the select program in Toronto to at least come down and talk to us. I mean, none of you people have been in any of our arenas to see any of the hockey yeah. that the select program is yeah. 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 quality program that is very well received by the parents and by the children. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Don West from the GTHL. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Steve and Corey and Phil for coming here tonight and giving us uh, interesting presentations, uh, lots of food for thought. I also want to thank all of you. Uh, sure, you know, some of the, the uh, comments here were passionate tonight, nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think that's a good sign that uh, the people here obviously believe strongly in finding the best solution for the kids. And so I've been here mostly listening, making notes. We're going to have this uh, smaller group meeting that uh, Frank has, has mentioned in the next few days and we'll talk through these things. Actually, the more I listened, actually the fewer notes I wrote down because I thought there was a consensus starting to develop and there's really only, as I see it, two or three issues. That being said, what Paul just said and the applause he got makes me wonder if there really is a consensus or not. Um, a lot of you were saying over the course of the last uh, half an hour or so that it was really just a timing issue, and you were all in for doing cross-ice programming in the, uh, the next season, 2018, in select hockey. Paul, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, arguing that uh, he shouldn't have his own opinion, seems to be suggesting that for select hockey, it should be full ice, and house league should be cross-ice. So I'm going to ask for a show of hands here in a minute. Um, somebody here earlier said, uh, did you ask the parents about this? Uh, frankly, that's like a, if I was going in for brain surgeon, surgery, I wouldn't ask the surgeon if he consulted his patients on his operating procedures. But I'm not asking the parents. I'm asking, I'm asking a group of educated hockey people in this room tonight. So by a show of hands, I'd like to ask, are you really in favor of going to cross ice hockey for uh, select house league plus select, yeah, which is the North York Hockey League. Okay, well, that, that's a good point. Let's let's be more specific. So my question is, for North York Hockey League select programming in games starting in 2018 season, I'd ask those who are, would be in favor of that to raise your hands. Cross ice. Yes, the 18-19 the season. Who, who would be in favor of moving the select programming to cross ice? Games. Yes, just for tight, just for tight. Okay, can I see the hands, please? 
can I can I then ask who would be opposed to that? Okay, thank you. Okay. Next next year, not this year. Okay, so I guess I'm right. There isn't really a full consensus. Just a second. Yeah. Okay, but I just thought I should ask that question because I want to know what your views are. I think Corey wants to know. Phil wants to know. Yeah, I realize that, but I think based on... The, I'm, I'm not asking for a vote. I'm just asking for an indication. I'm, not, I'm just asking for an indication of opinions, that's all. We're not going to decide this based on a vote. I'm Quality, right? That's why the heavy hand. If we're going to have a decision that affects GTHL, that same decision should affect OMHA, WHA, Alliance, and OHA as well. All the MHA, but I think it's the opposite. I apologize for that. As well. Otherwise, you know, we don't have that level of playing field. And with, you know, GTHL and OMHA being so close to each other, practically neighbor and overlap in a lot of areas, if you don't have that consistency, you're going to go back to that competing. So I'm going to go here because they do this. Or I'm leaving here because of that. So, I think just a comment says teams are already set, right? So, so both companies are transitioning here, right? Together, right? right? right. 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 So, the motion says that teams are going to start, you know, so that you're recruiting the year of pleasure when we change. The teams are already set. Right? So, I'm not talking about that risk, right? I understand, but even at OMJ, we're in the same boat. We had a team set, we had rosters, so we're ready to go. Okay. Just like you guys. We're in the same boat. I understand, right? So, I just want to make sure that whatever we do is unilateral from Ontario. So we're Ontario, it's seven partners in the open wedge, well, I guess us, the two Jews, five, all of us in it together. You know, and it's the beat. And I went back to the, the comment I made a little bit earlier, which is about we all are stakeholders. We're, we're not the customers, we're stakeholders to deliver to the customer. And, we, and, and collectively, we got to put aside what our organization is, okay, and come to the table and look at what we're doing as stakeholders and deliver the game. Tonight, we've heard lots of you know, good challenges that we have to face and we have to look at. There's a commitment here, uh, as Don and, uh, and Frank have said, that for a group here to sit down as a small group and to work through uh, th those challenges and, and identify uh, the next steps working with uh, that, that small group. And I think that the question that Don asked, I think it's a fair question. And the question was, next year, okay, how many of the organizations in this room, okay, believe that cross ice for select hockey. And the reason why he asked that question, well, I, well no, no, okay, I mean, he asked the question on tight. Six years of age. He did, he did, he clarified it, he clarified it, he clarified six years of age afterwards, it was asked, okay, when someone asked the question. Okay, cross ice hockey at six years of age in the select program for next year. How many are in favor of that? Okay, the other, the other question, how many are in favor of full ice hockey? Okay, no, 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 but, but, but here's, here's the question. 30 of you signed a document to Tom Rennie, okay, that said next year we would all implement cross ice hockey for six year olds. That's not, uh, no. Oh. So then, then hey. Yes. Okay.
by uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I can answer and go through that question. Okay, the national the national body okay has made a mandate that okay novice hockey in the 2019-20 season will be mandatory okay modified ice. Now, when we talk about modified ice, they're going through the process right now, and we're working with them based on feedback that we've received internal, what modified ice will look like at the eight-year-old level, okay, and the seven-year-old level. And we will be working through a process of what the implementation is, okay, for players within the OHF, okay, going forward in the 2018-19 season and 2019-20 season, along with the communication plan, what that curriculum will be, working with Hockey Canada, working with the partners, and the partners working with associations going through that. But rest assured, if we believe in being part of the family of Hockey Canada, and we believe in the game of hockey as part of Hockey Canada, then by 1920, it will be, okay, pardon? 2020. Sorry. By 2019 and 2020, it will be, okay, modified ice for five, six, seven, and eight year olds. That'll be cross ice for sure at five and six, potentially a half ice at seven, and a modified season would have a transition to full ice at eight years of age. What that specifically is, we have requ requested and are working with Hockey Canada to have the outline plan by December 1st of 2017 of what that will be so that can be rolled out so you guys will have lots of time for the information lots of time with the tools of what that implementation would be I definitely think that's valid that we need to have the input going through it. I think one of the, the, the key items that you know we're looking at right now is Ontario is the only group that runs a select program at the five, six, seven, and eight year old level in the long term athlete development program. There isn't a select program. It is a tiered program or a group program, which Dr. Norris talked about, that you tier players up in, in doing that. But it's not about you, you play in this one program down here and we take some kids out and we put them into a select program. Your select program that stands right now, that has three ice times per week going through it, may be your tier one program, but they wouldn't have to play in a house league. There are some challenges around that. I know there's some house leagues that participate with their house league team in the select program. There's some challenges around that. Those are the discussions we have to have. We have to look at those challenges and look at solutions. How do we find the solutions for the implementation? But rest assured, the rest of the country, including the OHF and the leaders in this game, do believe in modified ice as a direction to go. Based on the science, based on the ability to provide programming, and I think that, you know, a very interesting concept that Dr. Norris touched on is how do we utilize our resources? So the example he used in Cranbrook, you know, or uh, not in Cochrane, Alberta, is a thousand players. You add $200 to the fee, Here's your potential to build programs. We've talked at the national level about trying to make the experience of being a IP five to 10 year old coach, like I guess a bad term, but is, is sexy. Similar to being a HP one or a high level, you know, major junior coach or something. Coaches look at that and say, that's great to be at that level. And it's really cool because I get accolades. But how do we make that for the five to 10 year old, the teacher that gives that programming to these kids in the most crucial part of their development stage. Our best teachers in school better be our kindergarten, grade ones, grade twos, because those are the influencing times of our kids. Same in hockey, our best coach has got to be at our five, six, seven, and eight year old level. So I look forward to the opportunity with, uh, okay. Thank you.